Hi there, thanks again for joining me. Tell me if you've had this experience before. A lot of us have been shopping online for a long time, but especially this past year. I think the number of orders through Amazon.com has like tripled or quadrupled, of course, because it's a really easy and convenient way of getting things that we need. But maybe you've had this happen. A box shows up at your front door and you think to yourself, I don't remember ordering anything. And you kind of stand there for a few moments wondering what's inside this box. And then you open it and you say, oh yeah, that's right, I forgot I ordered whatever it is. Sometimes the number of boxes coming to our homes and to our neighborhoods, we start to forget what it was we even ordered. So it's almost like a surprise when we were opening the package to see what it was. Maybe something that we had ordered two weeks ago that was out of stock, or maybe just in the course of the business of our day, we forgot that we had ordered something. This weekend, we celebrate the great solemnity of Pentecost, the culmination of the Easter season. And I think Pentecost is one of those feast days in the church that's kind of like the unopened box that appears at our front door that we kind of forget what's inside of it. We talk about the apostles receiving the gift of the Holy Spirit. You remember the story pretty well from the Acts of the Apostles. Shortly after the ascension of Jesus, the 11 apostles nominate and select a replacement for Judas. We call him Saint Matthias. And so now the 12 are gathered with our Blessed Mother in that upper room, likely the same place where they celebrated the Last Supper. And they're huddled together, praying and talking and sharing for nine days. And after those nine days have been completed, on that Sunday, they celebrate the Feast of Pentecost. And during Pentecost, something radical happens. Now, they were celebrating Pentecost. See, Pentecost is not primarily a Christian feast, or at least it's not exclusively a Christian feast. It actually is a Jewish feast, a very important one, in fact. We recall for us as Christians how Pentecost happens 50 days after Easter. Well, there's the same correlation with the Jewish feast of Passover and Pentecost. Passover, of course, celebrates and recalls how God, through the hand of Moses, freed the people of Israel from slavery in Egypt and began their way to the Promised Land. So 50 days after they celebrate physical freedom from slavery, they celebrate how Moses, going up Mount Sinai, receives the Law, the Torah, the first five books of the Jewish Scripture. And as they come down, receiving the Torah, the foundation for what will become the Torah, they celebrate how God now gives them a way of life, a blueprint, if you will. There's this great connection between physical freedom and spiritual freedom. Yes, the people of Israel needed to be freed physically. They were in captivity, they were in slavery, and now they are their own people set out in their own land. But they also needed to be spiritually free. And the way to do that was learning the lifestyle of being God's people. So the same thing happens with our Christian feast of Pentecost. The resurrection of Jesus affords us the promise of eternal life. It affords us the promise of our bodily resurrection as we profess each week during the creed. We say that we believe in the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. So now, 50 days after celebrating the glorious resurrection of Jesus, we receive the Spirit within us so that we can live the lifestyle of being the people of God. So physical freedom and spiritual freedom are closely linked. Back to the Acts of the Apostles. The Twelve would have been celebrating in some shape and form this Feast of Pentecost. And as they were likely praying, all of a sudden, Though the doors and windows were locked where they were because of their fear that they might end up being arrested or even killed for being friends of Jesus, suddenly there is a mighty wind that rushes through the entire room. It's a reminder right there of how the Spirit of God breathed over the waters in creation. And then remember that first command that God gives in creation is, let there be light. And so all of a sudden, fire appears as, as tongues of fire, coming and separating and settling over the head of each of the apostles. And they are filled with God's Spirit and are able then to go out and do amazing things by God's power. They go out and they change the world. 
You and I also received God's Spirit. In the waters of baptism, we were forged onto Christ, grafted onto Him inextricably. And then through the gift of the Holy Spirit at our confirmation, we were sealed, that is, the gift of the Spirit was locked within us in its fullness, so that we could go out and do the work of Jesus, that we could spread the gospel. And then, of course, the sacramental life of the church enriches us and strengthens us at every point in our life so that we can have the ability to live as Christ's followers. We talk about the gifts of the Holy Spirit, but I'm not sure we really understand or appreciate as much as we should what we're receiving. It's kind of like that surprise Amazon box at the door. We need to open it up. We need to really look at it and use it. So I want to walk through the seven gifts of the Holy Spirit. First gift is the gift of piety, also referred to as the gift of reverence. This means that we treat holy objects, holy places, as just that, holy. We have a sense of reverence about ourselves. So we know when we go to a church, we behave a certain way. And that's very common. You know, we act one way in a ballpark than we would in a movie theater, than we would in a restaurant. Our behavior, our way of comporting ourselves, changes based on where we are. So we recognize holy places and holy things as sacred, as set apart. So when we go to church, we behave a certain way. We're a bit quieter to afford others the opportunity to pray in their own heart. We also are sure to bless ourselves appropriately. We genuflect or kneel before the Blessed Sacrament. We give honor and respect to those elements that are used during the sacraments of the church. I remember this uh, one time, I was in a previous assignment at a great parish, and there was an older woman um, who had really uh, felt the effects of arthritis. She was bent over terribly. She moved very slowly. You could see how the arthritis had really taken hold of her. And yet when she'd come into church, she would always, with great strain, genuflect before going into her pew. So ingrained was it in her that she had to acknowledge the presence of Jesus in the Blessed Sacrament. Even though she could have easily just given a bow or even forgotten it altogether and just simply stepped into her pew, she wanted to show that great reverence. It was a reminder to me of this spiritual gift. Another one is the gift of wisdom. We often think of wisdom as something that comes with age and experience, and certainly it does. But I know some young people who are pretty wise as well. Wisdom is learning how to properly order things. That is, what are our priorities in life? It's making sure that we put first things first and second things second, that we order our life a certain way. And we place those things that are the highest good at the top. So God, family, our faith, close friends, those have a, an eminent place on our list and then everything else falls in afterwards. Another gift closely associated with wisdom is understanding. If wisdom is recognizing what is important, understanding is the gift that enables us of how to order our days, how to order our life. Understanding is kind of a, a way of ordering in a way that's gentle with us and with others. It's also linked with compassion, helping others to also see an ordering within their own lives and helping them to find that same grounding in their life. Another gift is fortitude, also known as courage. This one's perhaps the most self-explanatory. We need courage in life. We need courage on a daily basis, even though we may not think of it that way. But we need to have this gift that enables us to be who we're called to be at all times. Because sometimes being a Christian isn't easy. Sometimes it's challenging. Sometimes we might be thought of differently, made fun of. So be it. The apostles and the great saints before us all endured some form of persecution, whether it was physical attacks upon themselves or just being thought of as kooky or weird or crazy. In all of that, we're meant to have courage to recognize that we do things for the sake of Christ as his followers. Not for reward, not for notoriety, but we do it simply because it's the right thing to do. It's the right thing to say in a given circumstance. There's also the gift of wonder and awe, sometimes referred to as fear of the Lord. I prefer wonder and awe because fear of the Lord makes it sound like we're, we're scared of God. No, not at all. Wonder and awe means that we recognize how great God is, how overwhelmingly awesome God is, and how small we are. 
one of the best ways of experiencing wonder and awe is in the beauty of creation. And so now that we are well in the spring season and summer's around the corner, the earth is more alive for us now than ever before. So maybe you've already gone for that walk on the beach. Maybe you've sat outside and looked at the stars at night. Maybe you've just enjoyed listening to the birds chirp and sing in the trees. Nature is a powerful way for us to experience the grandeur of God and how small we are. We are like a grain of sand on the beach compared to everything in creation. So we recognize how great God is, how small we are, but even in our seeming insignificance, how much God loves us. We are the object of his affection and love at all times. God created all of this in part to show his grandeur and power and majesty, but so that you and I would enjoy it as his beloved creation. Then there is the, spirit, the, the spiritual gift of counsel. You know, we use that term counselor, and you often will hear it in TV shows and movies that have courtroom scenes because lawyers are often referred to as counselor. The reason for that is, is they are experts in the law and they advise those of us who aren't what we should do. They come to our aid, they take our defense, they plead our case, our cause. And that's precisely what the Holy Spirit does for us. Remember at one point in the Gospels, Jesus tells his followers, do not prepare your testimony beforehand. Trust me, you'll need it, but don't prepare it. God's Spirit, my Spirit, will speak through you in a way that you can't even begin to imagine. God's Spirit empowers us in a particular moment to know what to say. There's also attached to that an ability to offer others advice and to do so mindful of our Christian faith. So, for example, someone gets into a fight with someone else and they tell us about it, we should not counsel them to go and punch that person in the face. That's bad counsel. We will talk to them about what it means to be angry and upset and how to direct that in a healthy way, in a way that leads towards reconciliation. So counsel not only helps us, but helps us help others. And finally, the last gift of the Holy Spirit is knowledge. Now knowledge is often thought of as factual information, and indeed it is. It's said that sometimes people stop learning about our Catholic faith at a certain age, maybe around the time of confirmation, 7th, 8th, ninth grade. But we're meant to be lifelong learners, not just in academic subjects at school, but in our faith as well. We're meant to get to know God, to know our Catholic faith more and more. So it's important for us to take advantage of programs in our parish, our diocese, in our schools, in our communities, to learn more about our faith, to constantly be growing. Here at St. Gerard's, we have an adult enrichment series that's been going on now for a little over a year. We've had courses in the Old Testament, New Testament. We're having a course that will begin uh, in just a few weeks and last through the summer on the sacraments. That's just one example of ways we can deepen our knowledge of our faith. It's always impressive to me when someone who's maybe well into their 60s, 70s, even 80s, coming to one of these classes and leaving saying, Father, I never knew this. This is amazing. We're meant to grow constantly in our faith. Reverence, wisdom, understanding, courage, wonder and awe, counsel and knowledge. The gifts of the Holy Spirit imparted upon the apostles and to us through the sacraments of the church. So unpack the gifts, use them, and it'll make all the difference in the world. Thanks again for joining me. Please be sure to like and subscribe to all our social media platforms to help us in the work of evangelization. Until next time, God bless you and your family.